Hello, we are meeting with um, Seymour Stein here in Florida, and he's going to tell us a little bit about what Virginia Tech was like, um, what Jewish life was like at Virginia Tech in the late 40s and early 50s. Well, I got to Virginia Tech taking a bus <laughs> from Brooklyn, <laughs> changing numerous times to get to Virginia Tech. I never knew that Virginia Tech existed. I didn't know where, it, I never heard of it, and I didn't know where it was located. The way I ended up going there, one Friday evening, I was, started, I was gonna go to my PhD in New York, and the professor that I studied with in City College called me in and asked me what my plans were. I told him I was planning on studying chemi chemical engineering, getting a PhD, and going to work as a chemical engineer. He looked at me as if I was crazy. He says, you, you can't do that. I said, why? In fact, you, you can't stay here to get a PhD. So I thought he stole me out of the school. I was a, good, a pretty good student, and here it is. He's asking me to leave and go someplace else. Unfortunately, I didn't have any money. City College at that time was, uh, had no tuition for people with an A average. So I was able to go there with tuition free since my family couldn't afford to send me anything that would, you'd have to pay for. So uh, uh, he said, well, wait a, a little bit. He went into his other office, came out about a half hour late. He says, okay, you're going to Virginia Tech. I said, I still don't have any money. He says, well, you have a research fellowship, all expenses paid. You have to be there Monday. This is Friday afternoon, Friday evening. You have to be there Monday. I said, never apply. So just go there, tell them who you are, and they'll accept you. So I packed up my cardboard suitcase, the only suitcase I had, and took the buses to Virginia Tech. They looked around, finally found that I had been admitted, all expenses paid with a research fellowship. So that sounded great. They even assigned me, I took place in the dormitory. I was the only graduate student, met the professors. Everything was great. They were happy to see me. They were happy to have someone come from New York all the way there. Everything was great. I was there uh, several weeks and I think Rosh Hashanah, time for Rosh Hashanah. So I was planning on getting, going to Roado because one of the Jewish families invited students to spend, have a, the holidays with them. So in, in order to, to go and take the time off, I had to get permission from the head of the department. I went in to tell him that I wouldn't be, I guess, next week for the following days. And he asked me why, I said, for the holidays. In New York, everyone knows no, when the holidays are. So he laughs, he says, it's not Christmas, that he tells me. I said, no. I said, which holiday? What are you talking about? I said, the Jewish holidays. I thought he would pass out. He turned. He, he looked, oh, blood went out of his face. He, he, was, he was speechless. Suddenly, um, excluded from everything. He wouldn't, he wouldn't even talk to me. And he was trying to ask me, get me to leave, that he didn't think I'd be happy there. Well, suddenly, uh, while I was there, I had to do some research to, do, for, to build some equipment to do experiments with. As I was building them, every day, I'd work on it until uh, fairly late. Then I'd come the next day and I'd see things partially dismantled. Then one day I was working very late and I saw the maintenance manager come in and take my equipment apart and start to reassemble the equipment there. So then it dawned on me what was really happening. The following day, well, I, re, I fixed everything, reassembled it, and went to classes the next day. The uh, head of the department comes and says, too bad you had an accident last night. What they did is, he, I was working with gases that could be explosive. He reassembled in such a way that it would that blow up blow. my equipment. I said, no, Dr. Melvin came in, readjusted some of my equipment, I straightened everything out. And for the next almost two years, I slept on a metal table in the laboratory. 
the only thing I went out is to eat and to take a shower in, in my room and, and spend the night that way. He assigned two graduate students to work for me as a PhD candidate. Yeah, you were assigned one or more graduate students to do, to, so you would monitor their work. He told them to give me fake data for me to use. And I thought they would give me real data. I had to redo their work right. so I could do mine. You could do yours. Uh, yeah. Okay. The other thing he did, normally at the end of each semester, you're supposed to be given some type of a grade. Uh, he never gave me a grade at all, you know, for the entire time. And it never, but I didn't realize you had to have some, some, some indication that you were doing something. <laughs> he put down incomplete. Oh, That's all he did, incomplete. And didn't, I, not know knowing that. any better, know it didn't dawn on me that there was any potential problem. Then suddenly, uh, uh, probably uh, about an, a couple of months before I, f I finished my work, I realized by not having any grade at all, I, couldn't, I don't have any evidence that I did anything. So if, if I, at the time I did my pre final presentation, he could grade me and tell me that I failed. Oh, yeah. My work wasn't appropriate. Mm. So I decided maybe I better do something about it. Normally you had a committee that involved your thesis advisors, number one, and three or four people, or maybe as many as five, under him. I decided if he was the leading individual at the, at the dissertation, he was going to flunk me. I'm in trouble. So I decided to get the vice president of the school, the provost of the school, the head, the head of the entire engineering school, and he was either the second lowest or the next, right. or the lowest one. Place, right. So I gave my talk. The VP stands up and may I be and says to me, may I be the first to congratulate you, Dr. Stein, and let me sign your yeah, thesis. That's a great story. That's a great story. Okay. Some of the other things that happened, I'm taking this course, and suddenly the professor makes a glaring error. It was obvious to me, not to anyone else. So I correct, obviously, I raise my hand, correct him. He says, okay, since you know so much, let's see if you can teach the class. He says, you're in charge now. He sat down. Okay. I teach the class the entire rest of the semester. I get a B in the course. <laughs> I, I was inducted you know, to an honor society. They forgot to invite me and lost my key. Little things like Little that. Things that, but I survived. You survived and you made it through. At that time, I think there were probably about a dozen Jewish students, and I knew them all. And we'd have Friday night services, and I was the rabbi for those services. Yeah, like when I was recruited, I, right. I had a, a, a millions of offers. Dupont for chemical engineer was the ultimate place you could go to work. They paid the highest salaries, and everyone loved to work there. A positive side. Offer. No, right. I had no problem. I didn't have to even apply those. You're thrown off. Is that yeah. This is where you can, these are place, the places that want you. Mm -hmm. And probably a dozen, I don't know how, how many, but DuPont was the ultimate place for a chemical engineer to work. It was the highest paid and the, great, the most prestige. Actually, there were no Jews. There was, you know, I'm the Jewish engineer. You, you for, so there was no... I, I didn't experience anything. They just, I just found out <laughs> DuPont wants you. These are pe places that want you. They didn't ask what I was. I mean, they, they probably could never assumed there was a Jew. No Jew ever came from chemical engineering. <laughs> Why would they assume I'm a Jew? Number one, in New York, there was no way for a Jew from New York to ever get a good job in chemical engineering, period. Yeah. You know, before I got, had my PhD, I'd go for an interview. I remember going to one from Esso, Exxon. The whole interview lasted, I think, three minutes. Sat down, uh, get tell me the name, says, are you Jewish? I said, yes, we don't hire Jews. Come on. That was the whole interview. Wow. I actually designed the mikvah for one of the shuls in Roanoke. 
They didn't have one. They wanted someone to design it, and I did. I went to work for DuPont. I spent a couple of years. Then ultimately, I went to combustion engineering, design uh, uh, nuclear plants for submarines. And I developed a lot of stuff that go into submarines. And then uh, one, from there, while I was still there, I went to Idaho to supervise one of the air transportable military nuclear plants. I found this basically bankrupt company in Ohio. They had uh, 250,000 square feet of plant. They lost money every year for five years. Their net worth was a negative <laughs> amount. So I figured, well, what can I do? I can turn it around. So I resigned my job. I was a senior, man uh, senior manager. Resigned my job, have three kids to feed in the big house. I'm going out on my own. Fortunately, I had a wife who believed in me. They ended up turning the company around. I developed a control system for an artificial heart. So I had some interesting experiences.